Um, my name is Arne Merz. I work for Züge. Um, before that, I have worked for different companies and have done about eight, nine years of enterprise C++ in financial applications. And that's where it all began, where we had large-scale legacy applications and um, where I wanted to bring a bit of clean code into it. And so this is a bunch of war stories and possible solutions to the problems I ran into back then. Um, great. OK. Um, as you may have noted, there's no C++ in the title. Um, the original title had the C++ in it. And since we are at a C++ conference, I think we should leave it this way. Um, what do I mean with this title? Um, there are different parts to the title. Someone just said um, many people want the second and third word and um, basically have the lower line of it. Um, legacy C++ applications. What's legacy code? Um, there's a definition by Michael Feathers and he says legacy code is code without tests. Um, I would also say code that has grown over the years, um, maybe is written in older styles, like um, when we're talking about C++, like uh, C with classes or um, Java without a garbage collector, this kind of style. Um, legacy code, old code also means um, we often don't know anymore why things were written the way they are written. Um, Maybe the original author is no longer in the company. Um, it's very often poorly tested and poorly maintained or not maintained at all because it's not tested. Better, don't, better not touch it, better not change it. Um, very often we have to deal with old, co old compilers, old C++ standards, not necessarily, but um, well, if you have old compilers, of course, we, we cannot use the, the modern features, but um, that's not necessarily the biggest problem about, about legacy code. It's a pain to work with. Um, and before someone throws a true soup quote at me, here it is. Legacy code is a term often used derogatorily to characterize code that is written in a language or style that the speaker, me, would consider outdated and is competing with something promoted by the speaker. And legacy code often differs from the, from the suggested alternative by actually working and scaling. So um, I'm guilty. I want to promote clean code, the first part of the title. And um, well, outdated was kind of in my, in my definition I had before. And um, working, um, yeah. If we have something that is working, of course, we want to stay, have it working later again. And uh, so we want, don't want to throw it away and replace it with something new because that would mean we have to fix bugs again. And so we basically want to take the software we have and re reform it, refactor it to be better code in the end. And scaling, if we have these large scale applications, scaling is often a, a problem because at some point the old architecture doesn't hold the data anymore or we have like put uh, so many uh, warts and hooks and crannies into the code that um, just doesn't, doesn't scale anymore in the, in, in the uh, matter of actually running the software but also, also in maintaining the software. So, it, um, in a past company, we had um, a bunch of tasks that were basically regular stuff that had to be added to the software. It was basically more or less the same feature, but in different forms. And it always came um, pre-estimated for half a day. And um, when I started, it actually never took less than one and a half days, usually more like two or three days. And I asked my colleagues why it is always estimated as half a day. Yeah, well, because 10 years ago, it took half a day to do a thing like this. Now it takes two or three days. So this is uh, grown over the years stuff. Large scale legacy applications, well, the same stuff, but a lot of it. Um, what I would consider large scale is it's not like 10,000 or 20,000 lines of code. It's more like a million 
maybe 10 million or more. So um, stuff that you can't just refactor in a few weeks and be done with it, so, but a, a code size where if you are a small or moderate sized team, basically going through all the code and making it beautiful would virtually last forever. Um, this is a city, um, Dubrovnik, others know it as King's Landing. Um, if you look from, at it from above, um, you do not really see any apparent structure, right? So if someone just dropped you into the city without a map, it would be really hard to find your way around. And this is a feeling I have regularly gotten when I was dropped, like, this is a legacy code space we have been working with for 10, 15, 20 years. Have fun. I mean, not having a map is it's, it's a good analogy because usually in those large code bases, do we have any documentation how we navigate around the, the code? If you didn't have time to refactor the code in the past, then you probably didn't have time to write documentation. So the other side, um, clean code. Um, clean code and C++, how does that fit together? Um, I mean, C++ usually is low level, a bit messy, so um, writing clean C++, uh, not really. That's what people usually say. Um, it is possible because um, we can do we can write C++ code in a clean way, in a cleaner way than we usually naturally do, or than it looks like if we let it grow for a bunch of years. Um, modern C++ standards provide a lot of features that make the code look cleaner, make the code more manageable, but um, we can also apply clean code principles to all C++, to um, if you have older compilers that only are capable of C++03, um, then we still can apply those clean code principles. So we do not necessarily need to have the most um, recent compiler to write clean C++ code. Um, I guess most of you will have heard of the clean code book. And this is an answer I have gotten really often. They have read the book, but um, there's not much in it we can use for C++ because it's all OOP, it's all Java in the book. Um, well, if we have OOP C++, we can still use the OOP techniques, and um, there's a lot of other stuff that is not about object-oriented programming that we still can apply to C++ as well. So um, this is just a lame excuse to not actually try it, but to just keep on going like one did before. For example, we can write short functions, we can write meaningful names, we can have good tests. This has nothing to do with object-oriented programming or with Java. This is all, well, language agnostic, so we can do this in C++ as well. Also, the underlying principles, like KISS, which means keep it simple and stupid, write simpler code to make it maintainable. Uh, solid principles are uh, single responsibility, open close principle, list of substitution principle, um, interface segregation principle, uh, dependency inversion. So these are all principles that are linked with this clean code term, which uh, if you're more interested in them, um, you can look them up there. You can find them all over the internet. DRY, don't repeat yourself in contrast to WET, write everything twice. Um, so just don't copy paste, but um, DRI goes further than don't copy and paste your code. It goes like if you have different parts of your code where basically the same knowledge is encoded, don't write the same stuff in another language or something like that. Write one source of truth and maybe generate the other code from it. That's not just only don't copy and paste. So these principles also are language agnostic, so they can also be applied to C++ as well. 
And of course, we can use the modern uh, features, range-based for smart pointers, all the stuff we have with C++ 11, 14, 17, whatever your compiler provides. But we can also use the old uh, C++ 03 stuff that is considered modern C++. Um, if you don't have smart pointers in the, uh, in the standard library, because we have C++ 03, we can maybe use boost smart pointers or write our own write RAI classes. Um, use stronger types. If someone has been here last year and seen uh, Jonathan Bokara's ta talk about strong types, or Björn has done a talk about strong types as well, you can find them online. Um, those already find a lot of bugs in our old code and um, they also make the code more readable and more maintainable. Um, the next thing I hear often is, but performance. We use C++ because we want to write performant code. The language doesn't make the program performant. We have the language to be able to influence the performance, but just by using C++, our code isn't more performant, and when we go there and try to manually optimize, because we have heard like in the past that early returns are evil because they make a big hit on performance um, that may have been with Fortran in the 60s or 70s or something like that. I, uh, at one point in the past, I've looked it up. Um, there are a lot of myths about how we have to write our C++ code in a weird and not very intuitive way to improve the performance. And if you look at it, it's not really like that anymore or has never been like this anymore because we have good optimizers these days, and good optimizers really um, are much better at in improving performance than we are. Um, it's very hard to guess where optimizers can actually do improvements, uh, performance improvements. And um, well, writing convoluted code that one cannot really read through and re re reason through is often also harder for the optimizer to reason about and actually can impede the optimizer in actually optimizing our code. So writing straightforward code very often leads to better optimization, better optimization by the tool we have, by the compilers, than manually optimizing it. So it's important, but we don't have to optimize every piece of code because um, while well, optimizing like uh, error handling routines or optimizing input output routines um, doesn't bring us anything. So you have to know where to optimize and where to look for. So before we go there and optimize manually, we have to use the right data structures. I've seen people optimizing loops and um, not realizing that in the loop they were like inserting stuff into a std map where each insertion has a memory allocation in it, which is basically the worst thing you, you can do if you want to have optimized code, uh, fast code. Um, we should trust the optimizer as a first measure because optimizers really are good and really get better. And um, we should find the bottleneck where we actually have the problem, where is the part that gets executed over and over and over again, and where can we actually gain some performance if we optimize it. And the most important thing, using profilers. Really working with profilers and profiling our programs, the optimized programs, um, can not only show us where those hotspots are, where we actually have to optimize, where we have potential for optimization, but uh, they also tell, of, tell us if the tweaks we make to the code, when we really want to manually optimize, if they actually did anything good. Because if you say, well, this is, better this is better optimized code and just check it in and never check if it actually is better, how do we know? Okay. So legacy code, legacy C++ applications and bringing clean code to them is basically a big fight and simultaneously, we usually have to fix bugs that are in the code. We have to apply new features, and it's a lot of work. Uh, 
and it's something we shouldn't try to do alone. Because, um, I mean, if um, I, I went to a team uh, back then and I was really enthusiastic about um, just having read the clean code book and I wanted to make it all clean and just started and uh, basically if I, I was working against the team or the other, the team was working against me because, um, well, at some point you have gotten to the legacy, to the mess. And this has a reason because maybe someone didn't know better and uh, didn't know how to write cleaner code. Um, some people just don't care. Uh, some people just have to like dead, have have deadlines and have to just make it work, just hurry to implement stuff and never refactor it uh, later. Um, and this is a, a kind of, of of team culture where if you try to actually uh, refactor something. And at another point in the code, uh, people are just doing the old, the old stuff they have done every time. Then you won't get uh, any better. So then you're basically you're working against them. So it's really important to have the team on your side and to have everybody be conscious about the problems you have in the code and um, about working together to improve the code base. So the first thing is to actually make people aware of the problems we have, the pain points we have, and um, yeah, get the commitment from the whole team to uh, really do something about the situation. And not only finding it good that you do something about the, the situation, but everyone doing something. Because, um, well, I've had the situation um, Imagine you you um, find like an old class that is doing some utility stuff, but also some business logic all mixed together, and you go to refactor it to replace it by something new. And after three days, um, a colleague tells you in the daily stand-up, hey, it's really great that we get rid of this crappy class. And in the afternoon, you try to merge it, and you get compiled errors because the same colleague has just copy-pasted an old class where this utility class has been used and um, you have it in the code base all over again. This is the kind of, well, if you know I'm working on this, why ju you just copy and paste it and, and we get it all over again. So people have to be aware of what you're doing and the team has to be behind the stuff you're doing. Um, as I said earlier, people might not know about clean code, about how to refactor, about how to care for the code base. Um, people have their ways, uh, things they have done always, um, program, check it in, run it once on the local machine, test it, it works, just check it in and go to the next task. This is the kind of habits and legacy knowledge that are in the team that have to be, uh, that we have to get out. Um, this um, is nothing that can be done uh, overnight. This has to be a long process of checking each other, of, 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 um, well, of getting rid of those old habits and adopting new habits, like checking, uh, writing tests, um, uh, doing code reviews, and um, to start with this, um, probably um, trainings, workshops are good to either internally or externally to, to learn about clean code, to learn refactoring techniques and stuff like that to um, really get the team going to know what they can do about the, the old code to, to get to better code. Um, these techniques have to be practiced, of course, either in the code base or by m making small uh, um, small test programs, a little greenfield development to to practice a bit of uh, maybe test driven design, um, um, practicing a bit of pair programming, practicing a bit of clean code without having this old mucky code base you have to work through, you have to work against. Um, coding dojos are a good alternative. Um, 
in our last company, we had like every third or second Friday, we had like a one hour talk where someone just explained to the team some technique they had found to apply to the code base to make it cleaner, just to share the knowledge and to practice it. So, um, but people actually got to the point where they knew where their old habits were bad and led to bad code and to apply it to get to better code. So, also awareness for the code. So, um, I mean, if you have been in a code base for five or 10 years, then it looks familiar and it may not look too bad for you. You just know something is wrong. It's just taking ages. It's taking five or 10 times as long as, it's, as the same task has done like 10 years ago, but you don't really know what's, what's the problem with the code. So um, again, there are, there are lists of code smells that can be learned um, where you can actually look at the code, not from the perspective of someone who has worked in this code for years, but from the perspective of analyzing how does this code look weird or what does this code, what could be better in this code. Um, old habits die hard and in a sufficiently large code base there will be people who don't want to change their habits. There may be people who don't care for clean code or faster development or whatever. They just want to do their job from nine to five. And if they do three tasks in a day or one task or a half, half a task on a day, it's, it just, it's just the same for them. Um, this is really hard to go against. Um, there can also be resistance from uh, management because learning all this stuff, um, refactoring, investing time in refactoring the code will cost money. And so um, it's a crucial t uh, thing to show management, to tell management that this investment of time and money in the long run will save time because we get to pick up more development speed. And it's easier to, to factor in new features into our code. Um, there are also other stakeholders in, uh, um, in the loop because if you invest the time, you initially will develop slower. And if you have customers who want all the new features, um, well, they will see that you don't get so much features in the first maybe year, two years or so. Um, they will want the feature, the feature, the feature, and they don't care for how the code base looks. Something else I um, saw in uh, those big code bases, usually if the code bases are so large, uh, then no single person can actually overlook the whole code base and know their way through all the code base. So you build like kind of silos. One person does all the database related code. The other person is, uh, does the UI. The third person maybe does the business logic and something like that. And um, when you try to work as a team on this stuff, then the UI guy sooner or later will have to work on the database code or have to refactor the, the uh, business code as well. And um, you often see people who say, well, that's my part of code. I know how it works and um, you can't really grasp it. Um, I, don't, I don't want you to touch it and this kind of style. So you really have to be careful about that and make them see why refactoring the code base as a whole is important and um, why this kind of silo thinking isn't, doesn't uh, is not going to work if you want to restructure the whole code. If you have some bad apples in the uh, team who really don't want to work along with the team, um, well, the code base is large enough. Um, you could try to either reassign them or to uh, put code reviews in place to, to really check that they don't uh, don't decrease the, the, the code uh, quality in the parts where you have already done the refactoring. 
but um, it's, it can be really hard to work basically against those people because if you have enough of those, um, they'll, the whole effort is, is going to waste. This is from one of the teams I work with. This was actually um, like two or three people in a team of 10-ish uh, who really didn't want to improve the codes at all and just wanted to do their work and just wanted to have everything as it was before. Um, they really ruined the effort and um, they actually were the, the, the reason why I quit that company at one point. So um, I don't have a, a ready solution for this kind of, of, of thing. So. Of course, with this, uh, with legacy code, with legacy habits, there's also legacy processes. Um, for example, uh, the thing I said, uh, where we got the tasks that were already estimated, of course, the developers should estimate the tasks and uh, not some business analyst who is, well, it always took a half a day, so it will take half a day now. Um, you have to take control over the processes and um, maybe um, also adapt the processes by, um, well, I don't say to go full agile, but um, this kind of retrospectives and inspection, what get, what went well, what doesn't uh, go so well, how can we f uh, fix our processes to get to better code. This is also a, a really important part of, of getting the team together to work on the, pro on the problems. So now, that we have the team together, how do we start? Um, the main thing to get to a better code base is refactoring. I don't know if it's really readable in the back. Um, this is one of the definitions you find online. Refactoring is a process of restructuring existing computer code without changing its external behavior. So um, for the business analysts, we work without getting anything done, more or less. So this is something we have to transport. We have to, to, to tell the non-developers to understand why we are doing the thing in order to work faster in the future, because this is actually really a time investment we are doing in our code base. And this is something everyone has to understand, because um, if they do not really understand it at some point, um, maybe a manager or someone else will pull the plug and um, you're back to the old habits. Um, refactoring, well, is a key to legacy code to, to clean up the code. Um, we cannot really do test-driven uh, development in, in when we just add features or bugs in a legacy code base because, well, often the code base is so entangled that it's hard to write really good unit tests um, we can use test, uh, TDD when we write new functionality, but usually with the old functionality we have to kind of get our test running and then just refactor and um, work with what, with what we have and work as good as we can, but uh, no real test-driven development. Uh, refactoring should be planned. We have to plan where we want to refactor. Um, basically, um, we could have like millions of lines of code that are really bad code, but if we don't have to touch them in the foreseeable future, there's no use in refactoring those code, that code as long as it works. We have to refactor to concentrate on the parts of the code that really are a pain point where we regularly have to touch the code and where we regularly run into, into problems, where we introduce new bugs, where the tests are, test coverage is not good, where uh, it's really painful to, change, to actually change the code. So we can leave the code that's good enough for some value of good enough. We don't have to, to make it really beautiful, it just has to work and we have to more or less read through it. There are probably pays, uh, um, spots in the code base that really are not readable that we should concentrate on first. Um, we shouldn't touch code that never has to be touched um, because, well, who cares if it's dirty behind the kitchen sink. Um, code we are not too sure about 
better bring it on a test first maybe and um, be sure about before we actually touch it. And um, also code that uh, we really cannot test is dangerous, dangerous to touch because um, if you cannot touch, test it, we don't know if you break something. Um, to find these hotspots that are really often touched, um, there is a good well, book, blog, um, talk videos by Adam Thornhill, Your Code as a Crime Scene. It's a really interesting book where he applies um, forensics to a code base. He goes basically with, with, with scripts to the commit history, he looks at which parts of the code are committed most often, where are the most changes, um, maybe where have the most bugs been and this kind of stuff. And um, he shows that you really quickly can reduce the, po the points on the code where you have to actually really good returns of investment if you start refactoring there. Remember, it takes basically an eternity to refactor the whole code base. So our goal cannot be to make all of our code really beautiful, but we have to reduce the main pain points to make the uh, code where we really have to work with good enough and not really beautiful. So that's basically what I said, so main pain points, um, no cosmetic refactoring, so um, don't start, well, this is the code we have to refactor at first, I will fix the indentation. This won't help much. So fix the actual functionality, uh, fix the actual structure of the code and don't go into too much details because there are lots of other things to do to, to refactor. Um, no side tracking is important. Usually if we look at one point in our code, we don't see one problem. We see like 20 problems and we can't fix them all at once. So we pick one problem and fix that one and then pick the next problem because um, if we have like multiple construction sites at once, um, usually none of them gets finished. Um, and also having in mind that we have to do this other work as well, like fixing bugs introduce new features, we have to really look that we time box our refactoring work and narrow it down so we actually get it done in a, a short amount of time and not be blocked by a huge refactoring task that lasts for several months or something like that. Uh, what goals could we have in mind with refactoring? Well, we could focus on getting code under test which is, well, also often a prerequisite for further refactoring. Um, for having less bugs, well, if you have the code on a test, we usually also reduce the number of bugs, but um, also making the code more readable, more approachable by programmers reduces the number of bugs because um, in a highly convoluted code base, you don't see where something looks off because everything looks off. And if you just have a good structure in your code, it's easier to see parts of the code that don't really look good. Um, faster development, of course, we want to go faster in the future. Well, now we have to invest some time to get there. Um, faster onboarding also often is a, is a thing um, because um, if we have this large code base and we are getting slower and slower, the first thing management usually does is throwing more people at the problem. And throwing more people at the problem in the beginning usually means that one of the more experienced developers has to introduce those people to the whole big code base, to this city. And if you have like a bit of structure, a bit, a bit of code that is well structured where onboarding is easy, we can just uh, assign newcomers at first to this well structured code, part of the code where they can work and uh, where the more experienced people can simultaneously refactor parts of the not so clean code base. Um, shorter compile times, especially in C++, if not everything is depends on everything else, we can, uh, well, we can uh, separate stuff from each other, which really includes the amounts of headers we have to include, uh, uh, reduces the amount of headers we have to include and uh, this in turn reduces compile times, which makes these circles of code something, compile it, run the tests, 
considerably shorter. If you have sh short tests that are fast, um, it still won't help us to have a test that run 30 seconds if building the code lasts 20 minutes. So if you really can reduce the compile times, this is one of the two things we have to reuse, compile times and test times. Then we have these circles and get faster and faster with our development. Because at my last employer, one of the main things I did, or one of the things, main things the team did, was waiting for the compilation to finish. We had like compile times. Uh, if we touched a few uh, utility headers, the whole project had to recompile, and it took about 40 minutes, where you could do nothing else because the, whole, the, the laptop was blocked. Um, refactoring, restructuring the code is also good to get a scaling architecture. Um, I mean, if you have one big blob of code of entangled, um, one entangled mess, it's not really scaling anymore. So if you have like heavy load on some parts of the code and if you have modularized it, you could go maybe for microservices or something else to just scale it up. And um, this can also be one of the focus points we can have when we do um, this large scale refactoring. We should separate it from daily maintenance. So either refactor or fix bugs or add new features, but not mix it up. Sometimes to add a new feature, it's good to do a refactoring first. So if in the analysis state of the new feature, we see, well, we could do a refactoring first to then add the feature faster then split it into task first the refactoring then the feature so you can track time of how many how much time we spent while we were refactoring and how much time how much time we spent while uh, actually working um, if we don't have tests we cannot really refactor really refactor but if we have this big ball of mud architecture it's not really easy to write unit tests where because um, well if everything is entangled everything is put together um, depends on each other you want to test one class and this task class depends on that one and on that one and you have basically 40 50 80 percent of your code base in the hand in the hand before you can actually write a test on about it so um, this can be a problem and we have to see how to to approach it um, the first thing we can do is write very small tests, uh, steps where we can basically prove that they are correct, where we don't need tests then. Um, have people code review, um, write really small stuff, use the refactoring tooling if available, and if it's proven to be correct refactoring tooling, um, then you can do like these small uh, steps to actually disentangle the mess and get your code in a testable state. The other approach is starting with system and integration tests, uh, testing large parts of the application to nail down a bit of the behavior and um, to be pretty sure that you haven't broken too much and then start with the refactoring and uh, see later that the classes actually behave like you think they should behave. Um, as I said, we can refactor them to, to um, with the small steps to decouple parts of the code, bring this part of the code into smaller tests, and then st uh, keep on dis uh, uh, well, decou decoupling the parts of that one, and, and uh, so break it down into small parts that are actually testable with fast unit tests, and where you don't have to set up your whole system, including the database and everything, to, to just run a simple test. Um, what I've seen once was um, there had been an architecture, an actual architecture with different modules in the code base, and then uh, different features had been added and um, dependencies had been added, and in the end we had like five modules, but they were like um, completely intertwined and you couldn't uh, see where was one module, where was another module, apart from namespaces. Every CPP file had basically 
include stuff, include stuff, using namespace one, two, three, four, five in every single file. So basically, you had like one big namespace with five with five different names, more or less. Um, but people still said, well, I cannot really take this functionality and move it over there because that's another namespace. It's not another namespace. If everything is intertwined, you don't have different namespaces, you don't have different modules. You can just move things from A to B. But it's a mental hurdle to, to, to move things from one namespace to another because they could be somewhat separated still. If they really are not, think about actually throwing away the namespaces and rebuilding them. Because if you have one big module, if you have one big mess, don't fool yourself, you have one module, you have not, do not have five modules, even if you have five different namespaces. And then if you have actually um, functionality that belongs together, you can move the parts freely, as reassemble them, and then maybe you have at some point, if you have reduced the coupling between the different then to be modules, you have actual modules again. Um, so we have to not only, we have to consciously design the new architecture. This may not be the old architecture. Um, I've seen architecture that was one big ball of mud and the architecture document was stated like eight or nine years ago and said we have this component, we have this component, and we have this component. And when we really looked at it, the actual functionality we had in the code one of those five components the architecture had shown like eight or, eight or nine years ago, they were, had moved. And this is something we have to do. We have to really look at our code and see where is the actual different, maybe different architecture we have today instead of trying to fit everything in an architecture that is, that is as outdated as our code base. Um, so what about rewriting? Um, can be an option if you have smaller components. If you have larger components, well, writing a large component from scratch, um, a component we have maybe worked on for five to 10 years, probably also takes five to 10 years. We, maybe we know a bit more about clean code and stuff. We know, know a bit about errors we have done, but we don't know about the errors we will do when we write from scratch. When we have work in software, and we refactor it and we have it on a test, we can be sure that we don't introduce new bugs that we don't know about. So these are the cons. Um, we also probably, when writing a new component, we can just not throw out the old component and plug in the new component because in our large code base, especially if we have these big intertangled mess, um, it's probably a problem to, to, uh, to replace it at once. We have, may have parts, uh, too, too many different uh, parts of our code that uh, uses this component, so it might be a good idea to have the old component living beside the new component and just swap out the parts piece by piece. And, but during that time, we have to basically at the new functionality we have, we need to have in this component uh, in both parts. So rewriting has to be something that we can do in a short amount of time and that cannot go over years. I've heard of uh, software projects where, uh, I think it was a browser in the 90s, where they tried to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, seven million lines of code, and they never finished because um, it took them like four or three years to, uh, to, to realize that they had to do this double maintenance and they didn't have the manpower and they didn't have the knowledge to and the new thing was buggy and in the end the new thing was as legacy code as the old stuff so um, they basically wasted a lot of time. What can be good when we rewrite a component is um, we can start with clean code, maybe with test-driven development, and we can really start from scratch, which can be a bit of fresh air and a bit of, well, actual fun instead of wading through the old stuff. Um, we have only the interface that matters. We don't have to, to just accommodate the old design that is still in our code and to refactor it, because refactoring can be relatively slow. Um, 
we can account for the way we use the code today and not how it was meant to be used when the component was created like 10 years ago. And um, we can account for the way we maintain it today, we, how we add new features. Um, at an old company, we had like a system where usually you could um, add some, some, some configuration to a database and it just worked. And then they had a uh, well, they they had some some special features where just entering the stuff in the database did not work anymore because it's more functionality was needed and the database didn't just quite fit it. So we started to code it, one exception, two, maybe three, maybe four exceptions. When I started there, they had like ten thousand lines of exceptions to the stuff they could put in the database. So we came up with a different means with a domain-specific uh, domain language that we could just put as normal strings into the database that could be parsed and where we could put everything basically into this domain-specific language and we didn't have this problem that the old database-driven uh, thing wasn't quite fit for the use we had for the component now. What about tooling? Um, IDEs these days, modern IDEs, um, have a lot of good tooling uh, for refactoring. Um, if you have seen the JetBrains booth downstairs, um, they have like a plugin for Visual Studio and they have CLion, a really good IDE, where you can like <coughs> just select a few lines of code and say factor out a function, give it a name, and it generates a new function for you and uh, replaces the old, the old lines with a new function call, stuff like that. Really good stuff and it's really reliable. They're still developing a lot of stuff, but uh, it's, well, I think um, with Java and with C Sharp, we have this kind of stuff um, in the IDEs for years now, but C++ is slowly getting there. Um, static analyzers who tell us where the code looks a bit fishy. Well, if you have a really big co a legacy code base and you uh, add a static analyzer, you will probably spend a few months uh, with tens of thousands of warnings until you get rid of them. Um, other refactoring aids. Um, the problem is the tools, if you have, if you're bound to an older compiler or an older IDE, those tools might not be available. Then you basically have to use a compiler to help you. Of course, we can also always consider to switch a new, to a new IDE or a new compiler, but especially if we are uh, bound to some older compiler that has, um, well, has some proprietary framework uh, tied to it and we're using it or has some language extensions, uh, then it's not that easy to get rid of the old compiler. Um, in that old company, we were using um, Embarcadero, alias Codegear, uh, alias Turbo C++ Builder, which was tied to a Delphi UI framework. So we couldn't just switch to GCC or Clang or Visual Studio because um, those couldn't interface with the Delphi UI framework. So the first thing we had to do was get rid of the framework, which was like 120 UI classes of course, including lots of business logic in the UI classes, because how not? And um, so the first thing we started was um, separating the actual UI and the business logic, and it took us like one year to clear the first 20 classes or so. So um, I think they are still going on this one. So yeah, we. If you want to switch the compiler, this can be a refactoring all of its own, like I said, um, separating the uh, business logic from the UI classes and st stuff like that. Um, can be smaller refactorings if you are, um, if you have like things where the, uh, you have just a property stuff. Uh, we had an Embarcadero in C++ Builder. This was um, a few lines of code where we just got to throw the property stuff out and uh, the, those um, language extensions um, if they are not baked too deeply into the um, application, this can be done relatively quickly, but um, if we have these big frameworks, it takes its time. So really quick, um, if you don't have refactoring tooling, we can get help from the compiler. 
Um, for example, renaming a function uh, just rename the original function, and the compiler will tell you with error messages where you have called the function because it doesn't recognize it anymore. Um, use overwrite and final to see where you have to overload and um, uh, fu functions. If you make a base class virtual function final, then you will see all the classes that overloads this function because the compiler will tell you you cannot overwrite the function because it's final in the base class, stuff like that. Um, Strong types again with explicit conversions, so you don't convert from maybe a length to a, uh, an area size or something like that. Um, and really heed the warnings and errors. I see lots of projects that either don't use warnings and uh, warnings, or that um, enable warnings, but uh, Pragma warn uh, of all the warnings they didn't want to get rid of for some reason. So. Um, put the, the warning level to the highest you can and um, fix a lot of errors, which also may fix a lot of bugs. And just a small example um, how we can factor out a function. Um, let's say we have this create tree function and we have these first three lines are basically creating a, a root node and then you have for each of the children of, the, of your data, you create a child node. And we want to factor out those three red lines. So the first we can do without any refactoring help, we put braces around it. And the compiler will tell us down here, well, new node is something I don't know. It's an error because it's scoped. So we know what our new function has to return, the new node. So we make a lambda out of our block. At first, we take everything that is above it by reference, reference because um, we deal with that later. We return the new node, and we have the outer new node down here is like calling that lambda. The next thing is, well, what do we have to pass into the lambda, into the function? Remove the reference, and then we capture nothing from outside. And then the compiler will tell us, well, um, I don't know what data is. So obviously, data has to be the parameter for our function. Then we make it all function parameter, pass it to the, well, not yet function, but lambda. And if you have done this, you can just move it out as a function. Maybe we then see that we don't use actually the tree data here, but only the root data in this function, and we can do like a bit of cleaning up stuff, but this is basically how you get, to te get the compiler, the, this kind of trick, to tell you what you have to do where you're using stuff that you don't want to use or that you want to factor out. So, um, dealing with this kind of legacy code is costly. It costs a lot of time to onboard the team, to train them, to do the actual refactoring, um, probably you'll never be done with the refactoring because, um, well, 10 years or 15 years of producing legacy code will take probably an, um, a similar amount of time to get rid of the legacy code. Tests are really important because without tests you don't know if you break something while refactoring, but the most important thing actually is a team because you can't work alone or with two people against the rest of the team. Any questions? We have like 10 minutes left for questions. Comments? Thank you. John. Uh, about the um, forensic techniques for finding uh, the hotspots, uh, I wonder about techniques for finding something that is it, actually never changed because it's absolutely terrible. But, but a lot of code uses it and makes weird workarounds for, for its uh, deficiency. Mm -hmm. But, but it, it doesn't show up as a hotspot because it's never changed. So, so the question find this. The question is, um, how do you find code that has never changed so that probably may not come up as a hotspot in, this te in the technique of Adam Tornhill, but that you have to work around in a code base because it has a weird interface or something like that? Um, that's a very good question. Um, probably the next time when you try to, when you, when you see it, 
you see a point where you could refactor the interface. When you then try to refactor the interface, you will probably find all the instances of the code where you have done this kind of workaround. Um, I don't know of a good technique to find, uh, well, where do I have like repeatedly written weird code to, to, to work around a, a non-optimal interface. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, so regarding a like a very big code base yeah. that has let's say no mock, no mock function or mock data or whatever, that mm -hmm. is, uh, and writing that will take a very very long time. And the idea is at least to start with uh, system tests and integration tests. Yes. So what, what would you recommend to go into that direction? Um. If I understand you correctly, you mean you have a big code base with no mocking functionality? Yeah, no, it, it, uh, or you can mock, but yeah. it hasn't been done, basically. Okay, you don't have any mocks, and um, you uh, start with integration tests and system tests, and um, well, how you write the mocks, or? Yeah, how, how do you move towards? Uh, yeah, how do you, okay, how do you approach this, approach this kind of problem? Yeah. Um, I'd probably look for what looks like separations of layers or separations of, of, of big parts of modules and try to get into the interface of those modules, maybe make an intermediate layer and record what is passed through the uh, through those layers, through, through the API basically of your module. And then you can basically record this and use the, the recordings as a mock. For example, you have a UI and it's, um, runs against maybe a, some calculation, some business logic or, and um, you record what the business logic responds to the questions from the UI, and then you can basically use these recordings to mock up the business core. More questions, comments? Yes? I don't understand you. Could you come to the front, please? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So the question was: um, refactoring is a team effort, and you sometimes have resistance. Um, so how do you get those people who resist on who resist on your side? Um, sometimes uh, what can work is um, doing like. Uh, well, some secret ops, just doing it and then showing them later how whatever you did can improve the code base, can improve the way you work, can make the way you work fitter, uh, uh, faster, and then tell them, well, if we would just apply those techniques to all our code base, you could work as fast as well. But as I said, if you have people who don't care for working fast or for having good code, um, who just want to do their times from nine to five, then uh, I don't have a solution for that one. Yep. Uh, would you recommend, on a similar note, uh, would you recommend uh, introducing pair programming to, to uh, people like that? To work together with something that you easy to uh, think of? If I would recommend to introduce pair programming for people like that, um, I would. If you have any hopes of persuading them, yes, of course I would, yeah. But sometimes you, uh, at one point you recognize um, that maybe someone is a lost cause and, um, well, if you can't do anything, you can't do anything. <laughs> but yes, show them, show them programming techniques, uh, show them clean code techniques, show them how you can work fast, how you can work in a clean way. Um, Usually, often, often they see this kind of stuff and they adopt it and um, work cleaner by that. Yeah. Yes. I, I have a comment. Uh, you said that uh, you want to have an OP, a scalable architecture, tests, a lot of blocks and interfaces. I, I, I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, so uh, what I was saying that uh, we will have a lot of virtual calls because of interfaces and blocks. Yes. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, so the slide uh, regarding uh, bug performance, uh, there is some performance uh, loss because of uh, uh, all these things and uh, 
Mm -hmm. So if I understand you correctly, you have um, performance loss in crucial areas where you have interfaces and mocks and, and, and um, basically due to the virtual function dispatch. Um, there are techniques, especially in C++, where you can do mocking at compile time without having these interfaces, where you can use compile time polymorphism, where you can basically say um, the, maybe let's say the business logic, which is the business logic class I, I talk to, and this you pass in not as a interface pointer to the, or via dependency injection or something like that, but as a, uh, as a template parameter. And then you can switch for the test, the, t the template parameter. Sorry? Is it supported by GTest? Um, it is supported by GTest, but not by GMock. So you have to write those mocks for yourself. But I'm, but I'm not sh too sure about that, but because um, as far as I know, GMock also allows you to mock classes that are, haven't a, bi a base class. But I'm, I'm. I don't know exactly. Do you know about that, Bjorn? Uh, I'm not sure. I think they require a virtual destructor, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay, so... You can, but if you have any uh, data uh, inside the class, they can be corrupted because of uh, some function calls in the test. So, uh, you can uh, create mocks for the classes that contain any data, so this is the problem. And most tests of interfaces... Yes, you, can, you cannot contain mocks for classes that contain data, right? Yeah, well, you ha you would have the same interfaces, the same function function interfaces, and if you encapsulate the data, the data is private. Then probably in the mock you, mock you don't really care about the data because only care about the, the function calls and what you return. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There's no easy answer to that one. <laughs> so the question was, if I actually have a lost case in the team, uh, do I tell my boss or don't I tell my boss? Usually, if we work as a team and if we make decisions as a team, they already know who are the lost cases. I hope so. OK, I think uh, I just got the same session, session is over, so um, we could talk outside, but thank you.